Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Every week we have a special guest, but this week is extra special. It's the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Pentagon Papers. And our guest today is Pulitzer Prize winning New York Times reporter and editor Hedrick Smith. He's also an Emmy Award winning producer and correspondent, a best selling author, and currently executive editor of Reclaim the American Dream. Dot org. We'll review the special section on the Pentagon Papers in the Times and talk to Hedrick Smith about his experience covering that and several other issues during his tenure with the Times. Our host, of course, is Sri Srinivasan, the Marshall Lowe Professor at the Stony Brook School of Journalism and co-founder of Digimenters. My name is Neil Parekh. I'm the executive producer and guest host. And we are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We are also live on uh, several of Hedrick Smith's channels, his Twitter account, Facebook page, and uh, one of his author pages as well. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have um, uh, want to just do a quick uh, shout out to our viewers, Jonathan Borstein, joining us from the East Village. Uh, Doug Levy joining us from San Francisco. It's early on the West Coast. Ellen Austin joining us from New York City. So interested in today's show. Um, and uh, um, <laughs> uh, Doug wants to correct himself, ever the journalist uh, from the uh, San Francisco area. Miriam uh, Ber Berkeley joining us from Hell's Kitchen. Our friend Stephen Kaplan, uh, of course, joining us from Ramsey, New Jersey. Uh, another New Jerseyite, Diane Stefani from Margate, New Jersey. Prednia Haldapur from my neck of the woods. I'm based in Springfield, Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. In the DMV, uh, Prednia Haldapur is in Silver Spring, which is in the M of the DMV, Maryland. And Naomi Service is joining us from the Upper West Side. Uh, again, we are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, let us know where you're watching from uh, and make sure to uh, share this with your friends. Retweet, tag, et cetera. And if you're watching on Facebook um, or Twitter, uh, make sure you click on the actual video so that if you leave a comment, we will uh, see you. Ted Coltman is joining us from Washington, DC. Our friend Patricia Freudenberg is joining us from New York as well. We have a great guest planned for today, as you know. Uh, as we mentioned at the top of the show, Hedrick Smith, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning former New York Times reporter. He was there from 1962 to 1988. We'll, of course, be talking about the Pentagon Papers, but so much more. Uh, he is a uh, Emmy Award winning producer and uh, the executive editor of ReclaimTheAmericanDream.org. He's also a best-selling author. Uh, my... Uh, uh, it's two of my favorite books, The Power Game and The Russians, The New Russians. Um, these are these are books that were on my shelf growing up that my dad read. Uh, I'm so thrilled to have him on the show. We'll uh, go ahead and bring on Sri Srinivasan uh, to join us. Sri, good morning. How are you? I'm so excited to be here today with you. And thank you, Neil, for all the work you do with the New York Times Read Along. We've been doing this for five and a half years and we're live on so many different channels right now, folks. Please tag a friend, anyone who cares about the news, they can watch us live or watch us later. We also wanna thank our incredible production team that makes this possible along with Neil Parikh as executive producer. We have a whole team that makes this possible. So we wanna thank Paula Kiger at Big Green Pen, Steve Taylor at Steve DeReeve, Carla Baranakis at Kabara and Julia Weeks at Julia L. Weeks. Please follow all of them on social media and some of them will be live tweeting and sharing comments and links and they annotate the discussion. That's what makes what we do different from lots of other shows. And we're all part of Digimenters, our social media, digital media and virtual and hybrid events consulting company. So if you would like any help with projects you're doing, including summits, webinars, a talk show like this, or training workshops, please get in touch with us. We also wanna thank our friends 
at Muckrack who are sponsoring us, muckrack.com. Please check out their incredible set of resources for PR professionals as well as for journalists. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of our show, please get in touch with me and with Neil. We'd love to have you part of this online community that we have built over five and a half years. And I'm so excited for today's guest. Hedrick Smith is our guest. We are going to be talking about what's in the newspaper. I'll just show you very quickly here. I've got the newspaper laid out so you can see it here. Um, I meant to turn around the camera and I forgot to do that. So that's bad on my part. But the idea here is that we will look at what's, um, what's happening in uh, the newspapers, and we will talk to Hedrick as well. And it's also Pulitzer Week, and so it's great to have a, P a Pulitzer winner with us as well. The Times won two Pulitzers, one for its extensive coverage of the corona uh, pandemic. Uh, and so it's great to uh, be able to talk about the paper as well. So welcome to everyone who's here with us. Ron Thomas is watching from Dubai, and uh, we have Vishwadeet watching from Shillong in India. And uh, great to have uh, folks, uh, Linda from Long Island. Uh, this is the special section on the Pentagon Papers. And uh, we will be looking at that section as well. And Emily Silverman says, first time visit with a friend on the, with the onset of these times. So Emily Silverman is with us. And we really see how America is opening up, but uh, obviously lots of places in the world still need a lot of help. But I think we're ready now to bring Hedrick Smith on and have him join us. Let's tell you a little bit more about him once again. Uh, Hedrick Smith is a multi-talented journalist who has uh, won awards in television as well as print journalism. Uh, he was a New York Times reporter from 1962 to 1988, and he's an Emmy award-winning producer and correspondent, and he's the author of five best-selling books, including The Russians, the, and the power game, and he's the executive editor of reclaimtheamericandream.org, and we'll be explaining to you what that is in just a bit. Please follow him on Twitter at Hedrick Smith One, Hedrick Smith One on Twitter, and let's say hello to Hedrick. Good morning, Sri. I uh, hope you can see me. It's great to be with you. I remember seeing you before at Columbia and at the Times. Uh, it's nice to be on your show. Thanks for having me. Great day. Great yes. to, be, to be celebrating. Thank you. And thank you so much, Hedrick. You are a legend in our business. You're a hero to so many journalists. Uh, but I need to ask you, are you a morning person? I am not. I am not. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. I want to tell you, this is a special effort in your honor and in honor of the times. No, I'm a night guy. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, if you think about it, I was a correspondent in Saigon and Cairo and Moscow. Those are all time zones where you could file a story up to midnight or even 2 a.m. from Saigon and still make the evening edition in New York. So I got used to working late uh, in those time zones and uh, it stuck with me. <laughs> Maybe I was that way all along. It's not the drinking or anything like that. I just like the evening. And actually, um, one of my favorite times for writing books is between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. It's quiet. Nothing to interrupt you, uh, totally concentrate, get deeply in whatever it is you're writing. Yeah, I, I wrote all day long. I'd write for three or four hours in the in the morning through the middle of the day and then in the afternoon. But I loved writing in the evening. Uh, so it goes back into my journalistic habits. Well, we are very grateful that you would be with us, especially on a Sunday morning at 830. <laughs> my <laughs> wife is amazed. <laughs> it's the... 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers, and we'll be looking at the special section, both online and in print, that they have put together. But let me just ask you, you know, how are you doing? Where are you? And how have you handled the pandemic and your family through this crisis? I got to tell you, Sri, I feel incredibly lucky. Uh, but we came through, my wife and I were obviously both in our 80s. If you think about the 50th anniversary of the Pentagon Papers, we go back a ways. I've been doing journalism for six decades. Um, uh, we're fine. We're healthy, uh, and we're actually getting ready to travel. Uh, we edged out last night to the movies. First time we've been in the movies in well over a year. And we saw In the Heights, uh, you know, Lin-Manuel, uh, latest on the Puerto Rican section of Washington Heights of, of New York City. So, 
Um, we're active. We're alive. I'm, I'm doing uh, blogs and I'm doing videos on YouTube uh, every couple of weeks on subjects that interest me, economic inequality, particularly political reform, voting, gerrymandering, that kind of stuff. I've been interested in that uh, out of my last book, Who Stole the American Dream? So I'm active and uh, I'm healthy and I'm lucky as hell. Oh, so great to hear that. And I'm glad you already saw In the Heights. It's on my list of movies to see. So I'm excited to watch it. Tell us about reclaimtheamericandream.org, your, one of your many projects that you're working on. Well, I mentioned that I'd done this book, Who Stole the American Dream, which came out of the collapse of 2008, 9, 10, uh, and the enormous inequality of income and our stumbling economy at that time. And I was going around giving talks around the country about the book. And people said, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to fix that? And I'd also gotten into the uh, dysfunctional political system a bit. Um, and I got interested in uh, political reform. What was happening? Uh, were people doing anything? And to my surprise, uh, things were going on in all kinds of states that you might not expect it, in Florida and South Dakota and North Carolina, as well as Connecticut and, and, and uh, California and Washington State uh, and some others. And so I began keeping string on what was going on. And, and I thought, and I, I, th I got to have a place to put this stuff. Uh, people are asking me about it. So I decided to create a website. I had a young guy working with me, Owen Smith. Uh, and he was good at, at web uh, sites and doing it. I, technically, I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. So Owen set it up for me and it's now set up and there's a whole section on voting rights. There's a section on gerrymandering, um, you know, on funding of campaigns, on dark money, on, on uh, uh, public funding of campaigns, which is amazingly successful in Connecticut. Uh, and it's being adopted by more and more places around around the country, cities like uh, Denver and, and Baltimore and Phoenix and Portland, Oregon and so forth. And ranked choice voting, uh, the effort to change the electoral college by the National Popular Vote Compact. I mean, so and then I kept on the interest in inequality. And so you've got a whole section on it on the minimum wage, on student debt and what I call inclusive capitalism, that is businesses that are sharing the wealth more, where you don't have the, the high three, 400, or in the case of Apple, Tim Cook is making 4,000 times uh, what the average Apple worker is working uh, for. And remember the average Apple worker in one of those stores is usually a college graduate, sometimes with a master's degree. So we're not talking about manual labor here. Uh, so there's enormous inequality. I'm interested in that. So uh, we'll we'll talk about that. It's in the news today. It's right at the top of the front page. So uh, those are topics that that move me, interest me, and and uh, I really believe we're probably not going to get much done on the inequality issue unless we can clean up the politics. The political system is broken. It's a duopoly of two parties. Uh, who are resisting reform, particularly the Republican Party at the moment. Uh, so that's why it's so interesting to me. I think we've got to go through. That's a gateway issue. If you want to do something about the environment, you want to do something about family care, you want to do something about race or policing and whatnot, you need to fix the political system in your state. And this is happening in the states. It's not happening in Washington. Reclaimtheamericandream.org. Everyone should check that out. Uh, before we get to the news, I just do want to ask you about uh, the new uh, attacks on voting rights uh, that we're seeing across the country. Uh, give me some hope that this is not a crippling future that we see in front of us. Um, this is a serious threat, and it grows out of uh, what's amazing. It grows out of the enormous success of the 2020 election. 2020 election was not uh, thought of as a reform election, but it worked out to do that. Uh, you know, we had we had 29 states, uh, you know, 13 of them with Republican governors, who were promoting no excuse absentee mail voting, despite what Donald Trump was saying. There were Republican governors and Republican secretaries of state, as well as Democrats. So we had this enormous expansion of the electorate in the 2020 uh, campaign, in the 2020 election. We had 158 million people voting, 65 million, nearly 66 million voted by mail. 
Only 58 million voted in person on election day and another 35, 36 million people voted uh, ahead of time. So 101 million out of 158 people took advantage of all kinds of things like in Houston, Texas, uh, uh, Harris County, uh, 24 hour voting, okay? Uh, drive by voting. And it was the idea was because of the pandemic, people who ran elections, election boards, election offices, secretaries of state and so forth, they made voting easier. And it was an enormous success, best turnout in America in terms of percentage of the population since 1900. That's 120 years. I mean, it's amazing accomplishment. But if you are a Republican in office, uh, particularly if you're a Republican in the state of Georgia, you saw a state that you counted on as being red going for Biden by 10,779 votes and the loss of two Senate seats that actually gave the Democrats this uh, skin thick uh, majority in the Senate, 50-50 tie with the vice president breaking the tie. So uh, it was in Georgia where the idea probably came up first, uh, but also all around the country. Um, you can see a map. I've got two maps up on Reclaim the American Dream. Go to the section called Voting Progress, and you'll see two maps, and you'll see the states that reached out and extended mail voting in 2020, and the states that are now reversing themselves. And there are 13 of them that expanded mail voting in 2020. Their secretaries of state and their governors all came back and said, clean vote, clean election, safe, secure, despite what Trump said. Uh, yeah, maybe they're saying nationally, well, it went the other way, but not in our state. They're all saying in our state it was clean, and yet here they are turning around. It's a serious threat. And I think the person to talk to about whether or not we can be hopeful, believe it or not, is Stacey Abrams, because Abrams, uh, the former candidate for Georgia, uh, for governor uh, back in uh, 2018, who lost by 40,000 votes to a Republican. She came very, very close for an African-American woman in a southern state like Georgia. That was a phenomenal performance. And she was the engineer. She was the architect. She was the moving force behind the register to vote, get out to vote, tremendous effort in Georgia, which led to the victories of the Democrats in 2020. So if you were sitting in Florida or, or in Texas or in Michigan or Wisconsin or Iowa or one of these other states where uh, you've just seen some restrictive voting laws go in, uh, reduction of the number of days of early voting or the hours of early voting, or you need photo ID in order to get an absentee ballot and no more, no excuse absentee ballot. You gotta give an excuse. You're either at work or you're traveling or you're sick or you're elderly and disabled. Uh, you know, all states allow it, but eight or nine of those states, and by the way, New York is one of them, have very tough rules for how you can qualify uh, for the mail vote. It wasn't true in 2020, but the old system is coming back in. So I think this is of serious concern, but it can be met on the ground politically. In Texas, uh, the Democrats are now talking about registering another 1 million voters. What's going on here, Sri, as you and everybody else understands, is the demographics of America are changing. Uh, we are going from a really white dominated country to a country that is much more mixed. And you've got large states like California, like Texas, like Florida, in which the minorities are becoming the majority. And that is what is scaring uh, Republican politicians. It's not necessarily scaring so many people at the grassroots. It is scaring some, but it's scaring the politicians because they understand the demographics are going away from them. And they're taking a huge risk. They have made the Republican Party a white party. It is overwhelmingly white. It is catering to white voters. Uh, and you've got smart Republicans like Liz Cheney, a uh, congresswoman from uh, Wyoming, uh, Tom Kane, former governor of New Jersey, Republican. Uh, Paul uh, Ryan, former House Speaker. Uh, former House Speaker John Boehner. They're all coming out and saying the Republican Party is going the wrong way. Uh, they are a minority, but there's a fight going on inside the Republican Party. And there's a serious question historically whether or not the party can survive if it continues on this track because it is fighting demographics and demographics are destiny. But in terms of the short term three, 2022, 2024, 
This is a serious problem and people need to uh, get engaged and get, and get people out voting, registering, active, and figuring out how to meet whatever the new demands and qualifications are. Stacey Abrams made up her mind, this is a lousy system, we're protesting it, we're going to court, we think it's unfair, and she has an organization called Fair Fight, but she said, these are the rules and we're going to beat them. Beat them at their own rules. That would be that would be great. Miriam Berkeley says, Reclaim the American Dream is a wonderful website. Thank you, Hedrick Smith, for creating it. So this is great. Everyone should check out that website. We've got some other folks watching. Rajni is watching from Toronto. And uh, we have uh, folks uh, here is uh, Neelam's watching from Jaipur uh, in India. Uh, have you been to India? Actually, I have been to India, not for long, but I was uh, when I was in Saigon as a Times correspondent on my way home, I persuaded Jimmy Greenfield, the foreign editor, to let me stop off in Cambodia and Laos and Pakistan and India because I was covering foreign affairs in Washington. I said, I need to get acquainted with those places. So I did get there, not for long, probably for about a week, 10 days. Yeah, I got I got a chance to work with Jimmy uh, in his later life when he was working uh, to bring free press to the former the countries in the former uh, uh, you know in the uh, behind the Iron Curtain, including right. in uh, the Czech Republic and in Hungary. Uh, Neil's mom's watching from Seattle and says good morning. So she's out. Uh, there. Hi, Susan. How are you? <laughs> So great to see you, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, let's see here. Uh, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar is watching. She's the host, co-host of She's On Call, a terrific show that we... People tune in for that. And uh, thank you, everybody, for... Oh, there's the... Uh, today's an episode all about dentistry and teeth. So folks should tune in at 11 a.m. Eastern time uh, Shri, we're having a little trouble with your audio. Uh, Shri, your audio goes in and out. Um, just wanted to, to make sure. I'll jump back on the screen, uh, Shri, while you uh, work that out, um, and we'll take you on. Sorry about that, Shri. Uh, Hedrick, again, thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, in addition to the uh, Reclaim the American Dream, before we jump into the Pentagon Papers, uh, many people know you from your best-selling uh, uh, books. Uh, in addition to Who Stole the American Dream, The Russians, New Russians, and The Power Game. Uh, for those of you, for those of us who may not be familiar with your, your books, can you tell us a little bit about... Um, uh, these books that you wrote? Well, the Russians book came out of my correspondence for the New York Times in Moscow from 71 to 74. Uh, and uh, I was fascinated with getting beyond the diplomacy and the Cold War rhetoric of the time and getting to know what the Russians are like as people. Uh, I had a conversation, I had a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard, and that took me to Boston. I got to know a guy named Dick McAdoo, who was the publisher for Little Brown and of the Atlantic Magazine. He wanted me to sign a book contract before I went, and he said, you ought to write a book about why they behave like Russians. Well, that's what this book is about. And uh, I was fortunate because it came out as we were going through detente, and there was just an enormous appetite in this country. Uh, to understand what the Russians were like. And it's really about, it's about the elite, it's about the party, but it's not primarily about communism. It's mostly about their lives. How do they live? Uh, what kind of underground is there? What kind of black market is there? Uh, who smokes? Uh, who deals with a grandmother? Who decides what television channel you're going to watch? Just what are they like as people? Uh, and uh, uh, that resonated. And then the new Russians is uh, 14, 15 years later, during the time of Gorbachev, I was, by the time I had left uh, Russia for the New York Times in the 70s, I was kind of persona non grata. They'd written a whole lot of articles attacking me. So I wasn't welcome until um, Reagan went over there for the summit meeting with Gorbachev in 1988. I went back and I then did a documentary series for PBS called Inside Gorbachev USSR, which was a, a kind of a breakthrough series about perestroika, what was going on. And this book, uh, The New Russians, um, is an outgrowth of that. 
the power game is really an effort to try to understand what makes power work in Washington. Why are some leaders successful? Why, what makes a, a president like Reagan, not just because he's a nice guy, not just because he's popular, not just because he's a Republican, but what makes him more successful with Congress than say Jimmy Carter was. And it isn't, it isn't always party politics. It's often, it, it's the agenda game, it's the coalition game, it's the media game. I'm trying to understand inside politics, outside yes. politics. There, there are politicians who are good at, uh, at passing legislation, crafting, making compromises. And there are other politicians, say like Newt Gingrich, the former speaker, who are really outside guys. Bob Dole, who was a Republican leader in the Senate, was an inside politician ran for president, eventually became much more of an outside politician. But Gingrich was an outside politician from beginning to end. He never cared much about legislation. He cared about having an impact publicly. Uh, and, and he organized and he used uh, the C-SPAN uh, that records the sessions of Congress in order to, to build a, a following. And then he did PACs and he did uh, organizations. He was an outside politician. So I was interested in how power works and explaining people. That's why I call it the power game. What are the moves that work? What are the moves that don't work? Who are winners, who are losers and why? Uh, not just personalities, not just parties, but but how's the game played? And actually uh, it hasn't changed all that much. It's become more partisan since then. Uh, the tribes are further apart. There's a no man's land between them. There used to be overlaps between uh, liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats that you don't see very much today. Uh, the amount of money you can add two or more zeros to the amount of money I was talking about. But the power game is still pretty much uh, the way it was before. Maybe we'll get into that talking about Biden. Sure. And and I, I will say before I hand it back to, to Sri that uh, these are books, uh, the Russians and uh, the power game that were on uh, my dad's bookshelf at home when I was growing up that I read. Uh, so this is it's very special for me. This is this is part of I, I read you when I was uh, growing up in New York, obviously I read your byline and the books. So. Well, uh, I, I want to thank you not only on my behalf, but on behalf of my children, because those books sent my kids to college. <laughs> <laughs> if I had to do that on a time salary at that time, I would have had they would have had to all win scholarships. But those books paid paid my kids' way to college. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Went right over and paid the tuition and loan. You're, you're welcome. We should also tell uh, we should we, we should we should tell uh, Hedrick and our audience that. Uh, Neil's father, who was a journalist, was uh, and a publisher of a newspaper uh, here in in New York, uh, inspired this love of the New York Times, and that's why we do this in part is because Neil is able to put in this uh, great effort to bring this show every week. And his father, when he passed away, he asked that he be cremated with a copy of the Sunday print edition of the New York. Oh Times. my gosh! Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's whenever, whenever I tell that story, I the you know the hairs on my neck, back of my neck stand up. Madam, it's a beautiful well, one. before we go on, let me just pay tribute to my friend, Neil Shia, and, and, and a great, great reporter with re relentless courage, uh, relentless stamina, uh, great spirit. I mean, I can remember Neil uh, on one story or another, and he and I collaborated on a whole bunch of stories, both in Saigon and in Washington, not just depending on papers, but Neil's eyes would light up. I mean, he, he practically pop up, Rick, look what we got. <laughs> this great energy of his. And then, uh, you know, uh, when somebody suggested that the Pentagon Papers were stolen and they uh, shouldn't be uh, printed, and there were whole arguments about that, legal arguments and then bureaucratic arguments. So Neil said, wait a minute, these papers, this is the history of the war in Vietnam. And it's been paid for by blood and treasure of the American people. Uh, 57,000 plus have died in Vietnam and all uh, the money they got poured into that world. American people have paid for this. This is just giving back to the American people what they deserve. Remember the Pentagon Papers was McNamara's effort to understand how the war had begun, what had happened, what went wrong. He wanted to compile the inside history and you know, one of the what's really fascinating is he did it inside the Pentagon using Les Gelb and Daniel Ellsberg and Mort Halpern and a bunch of guys who went on to great careers uh, as national deputy national security advisor Mort Halpern and uh, and so forth. 
he did it and classify everything was classified and there are any number of articles from the new york times and other newspapers in there along with these top secret eyes only documents he classified it because he didn't want walt rostow and dean rusk and the pro-war hawks within the johnson administration to know that this document was being put together. I mean, very interesting uh, for that classification. That, that information comes to me from Mort Halperin, who was one of the guys who put the Pentagon Papers together. So it was amazing. And Neil, Neil was terrific. And Neil was great fun to work with. I mean, I can remember working with him uh, in Saigon. I took David Halberstam's place. Uh, the Times was worried at one point that Halberstam was going to be arrested by Noden New. Uh, Noden Zem, the president's brother who ran the secret police, and Halberstam was actually sleeping in different houses uh, at different times in order to keep safe. And at one point, he moved into the home of the public affairs officer of the U.S. Embassy to be safe. The Times wanted to bring him home, so I'd been covering Vietnam stories in Washington, so they sent me out there. I was on my way to Vietnam when Kennedy was shot in November uh, 1963. Uh, and Halberstam and Sheehan had a partnership. Uh, Sheehan was a one-man bureau for United Press International back in the early 60s, uh, and he faced three uh, AP, report, uh, AP reporters, Horace Foss, their photographer, Peter Arnett, uh, and um, can I forget, Malcolm Brown uh, was the other correspondent. So he couldn't get both cover Saigon, where there were all kinds of demonstrations and Buddhist monks burning themselves and one thing and another, and get out and cover the war in the Mekong Delta, which is where it was, south of Saigon at that time. So he and, Hal uh, he and Halberstam made a partnership. Halberstam would go out and cover the war in the countryside and Neil would cover the city and they would swap notes and they, they, you know, they, they covered each other's stuff. And so I inherited that and, uh, and very quickly, there were all kinds of things going on. I remember one morning I got awakened, um, I was sharing a house with Horst Foss, the German, a photographer because Halberstam had shared it and Brown had come to Horace and he was trying to wake him up. It must have been about five o'clock in the morning. Horace, get up. There are tanks in the street. There are tanks in the streets. I heard that from my bedroom sleeping under my mosquito net. And I said, I got to get up. I got to get out of here. What's going on? You know? And so I got dressed and ran out, got a, a little pedicab into town. As I went into town, I went past the home of Duong Ban Min. Wang Van Min was known as Big Men. He was the leader of the triumvirate, the, the military group that took over after No Din Xiam. And he normally had soldiers guarding his house and sometimes a tank or two. There were several tanks around Wang Van Min's house. What was interesting was the barrels of the guns were pointed in at the house instead of out to protect the house. And so I thought, uh oh, he's in trouble. So I headed down to Tudo, which is the main street down in the center of town where Sheehan had his office, knocked on Sheehan's door, got him awakened and told him about this. And then we started working the story, uh, trying to find out whose, whose tanks those were, what was going on. American embassy sort of poo-pooed the idea that there was a coup going on. And, and um, um, Neil says, well, I'm gonna call him Mordecai, Mordecai. Mordecai Brown. Mordecai Brown was a three-fingered baseball pitcher, I think for Chicago, for the Chicago Cup. Anyway, he's a three-fingered baseball pitcher. And the CIA had a really key agent out there named Lou Conine. And Lou Conine had lost two of his fingers. So he had three fingers. So Neil's code name for Lou Conine was Mordecai. So he said, I'm going to go call Mordecai and see what he knows. Uh, Mordecai had been involved with the uh, the group of coup officers that overthrew Noden and Zim. So he was very, very well plugged in with the Vietnamese military. And I went off, talked to some sources that, that Halberstam had left me one thing or another, and we put our notes together. And we discovered, sure enough, there was a coup. It was being led by a general named Nguyen Khan. Um, and, uh, and we went off. Uh, we got our stories together, and we typed them out on the old-fashioned Olivetti um, portable typewriter, spongy keys and all that kind of stuff. And then we went off to the PTT because in those days when you sent something abroad, you sent it out through the post and telegraph system. You sent it like a Western Union telegram. That's how we filed our stories back in the, the 1960s. So we get there, and of course, the, the, the new coup leader, Nguyen Khan, has ordered the PTT to shut down. Don't let anything get out. Uh, well, Sheehan was ready. 
uh, she came armed with uh, several bottles of Johnny Walker scotch. Uh, and Gia, uh, Sheehan had been taking very good care of the people of the PTT to make sure they got his stories out. And so he had regularly given them Johnny Walker Scotch, and they were still filing the last message that had they had been filing before the order to shut down came in. And he just attached our stories to the end of that message. And Sheehan's story went out to Tokyo, and my story went out to New York, and they ran the next day. And it's that's the way that's the way Vietnam was. That's the way Sheehan was. I, Sheehan was endlessly in, ingenious, inventive. Uh, he had contacts. He had a great range of sources, a great network of sources. Uh, one of the reasons he was so successful is he was curious. He was relentless. I remember reading um, the famous history uh, to Vietnams uh, by a French author. His name will come to me in a minute. Um, but Neil was a student. He was a he, he was a gregarious guy. Uh, it's just wonderful and great fun to work with. Uh, and so the Pentagon. I mean, we lived together for three months in the hotel in the New York Hilton Hotel on Sixth Avenue on the thirty second floor for three months together. So we had to get along reasonably well. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for uh, all that great information. Uh, we had last week Linda Amster with us, uh, She's who's a researcher on the project, and we got to talk about this. But we do have a big international audience, and of course, young people who may not know the story of the Vietnam, uh, the Pentagon Papers. Can you just summarize for us why they're important, why they matter 50 years later, and how they help change not just journalism history, but obviously American uh, understanding of American history as well? Well, the Pentagon Papers were important because they were, as I just said a few moments ago, a very deliberate history put together inside the government with all the accompanying top secret document messages from the president to the U.S. ambassador in Saigon, from the military commander uh, in Saigon to the Pentagon, to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, to the Army Chief of Staff. Um, this was a history that went on from the Eisenhower administration and the fall of, of uh, Indochina, uh, French Indochina, to uh, the Communist Party, uh, Ho Chi Minh in North Vietnam. And then Vietnam was divided and South Vietnam uh, was pro-Western. And many of the Catholics who had lived in North Vietnam, uh, including Ngo Dinh Nu and Ngo Dinh Diem and that whole family, they were all Catholics. They moved from the Red River Valley up around Hanoi and Haiphong in North Vietnam down to South Vietnam and the United States backed them. So the history goes from that period through the whole Diem period uh, through the Kennedy administration, through the Johnson administration, and it ends in 1968. Uh, and Robert McNamara, the American Secretary of Defense, who had been one of the architects of the war, but who had become disillusioned with the war uh, by 1968, decided he wanted to see if the history couldn't be put together, the record should be kept. So that kind of a mistake was never made again. Uh, that those documents, it's enormous, it's 7,000 pages of, of, uh, and it's broken up into about 10 chapters and there's a narrative for each chapter and then there's just a trove of uh, documents, top secret documents that goes with it. Uh, when we, the New York Times, published the Pentagon Papers, it's now out in a book. It's about as long as Gone with the Wind and we published that over, uh, I think, 10, 12 day period, I can't remember exactly, interrupted by the government shutting it down. The Nixon administration shut down, came with prior restraint. They said we couldn't publish it. Uh, Dan Ellsberg, the guy who uh, had been one of the authors uh, and who leaked the materials uh, to Neil Sheehan, uh, had, then went to the Washington Post and the Boston Globe and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And one after another, these papers started publish, republishing the Pentagon Papers after the New York Times was shut down. So the story was important as a, an exercise in power between the power of the national security state and the media, whether or not the national security state could shut down the media. Uh, Nixon, after all, was not involved. The Pentagon Papers did not come forward. It did not cover the Nixon period. So it's not like Nixon was trying to cover up his own tracks, which politicians do all the time. He was making the argument that this was jeopardizing national security. And our argument at the New York Times was it's not jeopardizing national security. We never print anything 
that shows troop movements, potential military actions, military dispositions, where weapons are, and that kind of stuff um, that's current. But this was 1971, and the history cuts off in 1968. So there's nothing going on except the diplomatic portion. There was a diplomatic annex, which was about the uh, peace negotiations, uh, peace feelers that were going on through Burma, through uh, France, uh, through uh, various different countries, Australia, whatnot, uh, trying to get peace talks going. And that was my field. I covered foreign policy and diplomacy. And I said, we can't print anything from the diplomatic section. This would violate national security because we don't have any idea which of any of these strands of diplomacy, even though they end in 1968 in terms of the book, the Pentagon Papers, they may still be going on now and we don't know it. So we didn't publish that. We were not, we were not unmindful of national security. We thought about national security and that was one of the arguments. The case went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the, the New York Times uh, was shut down. The New York Times filed suit. It went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court had to decide whether or not the American government could censor the media, the Supreme Court decided six to three, no, the government could not exercise what was called prior restraint, that is censoring something before it was printed. And then the government went after Ellsberg to try to uh, convict him uh, of stealing government document and, and aiding the enemy by providing uh, top secret documents and, and very highly classified documents to the media which would be available to the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese, our communist enemies in uh, so-called enemies in, in Vietnam. And um, they got stopped on that. That case got thrown out because uh, some people working with the plumbers, which was a secret uh, operation inside the, well, not inside the White House, but empowered by the White House uh, and the Nixon administration, they broke into the a psychiatrist's office, Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, uh, and the court ruled that the sheriff cannot break the law, that is, they can't go in and do something which is illegal in the, in the effort to try to prove a case against Ellsberg. So the case against Ellsberg was thrown out, and that ended the legal case. I think the importance of this, th this, this affected Watergate, this affects press coverage of the government today. I mean, there are arguments today literally going on right now in the media. There have been stories breaking in the last uh, two weeks about the Trump administration uh, getting the records, the phone records of four New York Times reporters and a couple of reporters from the, from the Washington Post and a reporter from CNN. There's an argument about whether or not this is intimidation, this is chilling the press, this is intrusion. And so the Pentagon Papers was a very important landmark legal case, as well as a journalistic publication, to Thank show you. that they couldn't have censorship and prior restraint. It supported and activated uh, the First Amendment, and it's had an influence on stories ever since. You know, the black prisons during the, the Iraq War uh, the wiretapping uh, of, of domestic communications and so forth by the Bush administration. Thank you, and what a what a great history. Let's just look at some of these photographs. Uh, you can tell us about some of these folks here. This is Abe Rosenthal. His son Andy Rosenthal was on our show as a guest. Uh, some, uh, and this is Jimmy Greenfield, and uh, this is Jerry Gold. And is that? That is me with a beard, yeah. That's you with a beard. <laughs> you with a beard. I, I had an Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Abe, Rose, uh, Abe Lincoln beard at that time, French beard. Oh, um, nice. And then this is this is also interesting. The this is in the uh, printing room, in the composing room of the of the press uh, at the New York Times. They were waiting. They'd already set the type, but were waiting for the Supreme Court ruling, and then went to press after that. So that's what we're seeing here. This is part of the special section uh, in the paper today called Uncovering the Secret History of the Vietnam War. It's designed by Jane Mitchell, who's on the design team at the Times. And there's just so much information, these big stories, but then these little facts at the bottom <laughs> talks about how many people, 58,000 American soldiers killed, 950,000 Vietnamese, soldiers killed and one to two million Vietnamese civilians killed. So these facts are there throughout the paper and uh, throughout this section. And there's also an online 
section that Neil may uh, Neil may show us what that looks like. But this is the Pentagon Papers and important history here. Uh, one thing I do want to ask you, Hedrick, is uh, the at a time when uh, you know we're we're seeing that the government some. American politicians don't want to even investigate the January 6th in insurrection. With, I think some of the fear may be from things like the Pentagon Papers of what happens when you have a proper accounting, right? Well, I, yeah, there's no question about it. People want an accounting when something important has happened. And, and, and the Pentagon Papers was an accounting. It was McNamara's accounting, which uh, Ellsberg made available to us and we made available to the public. Absolutely. There's no question about it. When you have something, think about it. The, the, the U.S., and they, we call it an attack on the Capitol. It wasn't a, an attack just on the Capitol. It was an attack on Congress, on Congress while it was in the act of sanctifying the peaceful transfer of power. That is the most vulnerable moment in any governmental system. And so not to understand all the things that happened. We don't know what, what, what Trump was doing at the White House. We don't know what he was saying. Uh, there, there are people who were in the White House with him during the hours that this uh, uh, riot was going on. Um, there are witnesses who could be called if you had a bipartisan commission with the power of subpoena to call them. Um, we don't know uh, what some other people around Trump were doing, what their contact was with the Oath Keepers or the Proud Boys or the Three Percenters, which are three groups uh, whose members have now been uh, indicted uh, for conspiracy, charged with conspiracy, uh, not just charged with breaking and entering the Capitol, but with a conspiracy to disrupt a legal governmental process that was underway. So there, there are all kinds of things that could be found out. And Mitch McConnell and other Republicans are arguing, well, what's the point of adding another commission? Uh, we don't need another commission. There can be investigative committees on Congress, uh, the FBI and the Justice Department investigating. Yes, but they're not putting it in Congress, they're, in context. They're looking at specific acts that can be prosecuted as crimes in terms of the Justice Department, the FBI. And anything done by committees in Congress is gonna be attacked by some people, mostly Republicans, but by some people as partisan. And the whole point of this commission, which was partly negotiated by the way, by a New York Congressman with the Democrats. So it wasn't just a democratic idea. It was initially a democratic proposal, but the final proposal that went to a vote on the Senate floor, and that never got voted on, but it got blocked, was actually put together by Republicans as well as Democrats. The idea was five, five, five Democrats, five Republicans, none of them members of Congress, none of them elected officials, all of them you know, well-respected people, each side picked its own people uh, and so forth. So the idea was to try to bring it forward as a true bipartisan, at least nonpartisan report. Uh, and that's important. We need to understand our history so that we don't uh, let it happen again. Thank you very much. Uh, let, uh, we're seeing the online uh, uh, design as well, and it looks really, <clears throat> really great. Wayne Camido is watching. Wayne is part of the design team at the Times and is saying outstanding print design by Dane, Jane Mitchell from the uh, News Print Hub. He's talking about this this section, so people should check that out. We're at 9.24, so we're about 40 minutes left with Hedrick Smith. We have so much to talk about, including today's news and what's in the paper today. So let's do that, Hedrick, and we'll come, we'll come back and remind everyone to follow you on Twitter at Hedrick Smith one and also to check out reclaimtheamericandream.org, the excellent project that he is uh, leading. And so the front page story, so first, if you could just reflect on all this color that you see here, uh, the old gray lady is no. Oh my lady. God! Oh my, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, it just became a different creature. It was great. It's great. It's wonderful to see uh, all the color. Uh, yeah, see, see the. Uh, I, I love see. I love seeing the orange on the front page. You know the tennis. Yes, uh, the unseated champion. Oh, wonderful, uh, wonderful. Uh, but but you're right. The papers changed. My gosh, it used to be uh, used to be uh, eight columns. Uh, now it's uh, we're looking at five uh, yeah. columns today. The actual size of the paper, you probably don't know that, but the size of the page has actually gone down. It, it has uses less. It uses less newsprint. But the main thing is it's still going. And there was a time there where people were worried that the Times was 
uh, going to run into trouble financially. Oddly enough, uh, Trump helped uh, the Times, uh, other print newspapers, and certainly helped the electronic media enormously because uh, he brought a huge audience back to uh, the media. And that's very helpful. So lots of organizations, including the Times, are, are now more profitable uh, and, and more seaworthy than they were uh, before Trump. Patricia asks, which section does Hedrick read first? Uh, I'm a traditional guy. I go right for the front page. Uh, and my attitude is that um, the editors there are telling me these are the stories they think are important. And they're often stories that I would not have turned to immediately. And that is one of the great benefits of, of a newspaper as opposed to reading it online. If you read it online, you tend to go for what you want to look for and you get a bit of tunnel vision of the news. And what the paper is doing is trying to broad your, broaden your vision. So, um, you know, I'm not a New Yorker, uh, so I don't normally turn to look to see what's going on in the mayor's race, but I know it's an important city. And, uh, you know, as a guy who follows politics, you know, I look at those stories every once in a while, and I probably wouldn't if, if one of them weren't out on the front page. But today, uh, my eye goes to two stories on the right-hand side of the page. I mean, the issue of the taxes that are not paid, legally not paid by the billionaires. I mean, there was a story in the paper, what, 10 days ago, uh, about how the 25 richest people in the country pay literally, literally almost nothing. Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and, and uh, on and on, uh, Warren Buffett out there in Omaha, um, you know, people with worth 50, 100, 200 billion dollars, uh, and they're literally not paying a lower tax rate. They're doing that for sure. They're paying lower taxes than some of the people who work for them as secretaries or drivers or gardeners or whatever. I mean, that, that's crazy. So this is a follow-up to that. I'll be honest with you, three. I haven't read the story yet because uh, when I got up this morning, I went to work for you right away. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I know you'll catch up. You said there was a second story that and caught your eye. The second eye. story is really important. Uh, this is a story Biden urges G7 counter China on foreign aid. Uh, that's fascinating to me because what we're looking at is a strategy that uh, the Biden administration is pursuing. Uh, what Biden is trying to, every president, and this is part of what I found out in the power game, if you're going to have an effective agenda as a president, you need to frame the individual pieces of legislation, the individual parts of your agenda, the in individual actions that you take within a larger framework so people understand where you're going and what you're about. And what Biden is doing, and he's doing it now in Europe, but he's been doing it with us here at home and he's trying to do it with Congress, is to frame this period as a time when the democracies, American democracy, but the other democracies as well, are being tested because authoritarianism is on the march. Uh, we have an authoritarian regime, an autocratic regime, obviously in China, under Xi Jinping, we have one uh, under Vladimir Putin in Russia, uh, but also Brazil, Bolsonaro, and Hungary, uh, and it, it goes around the world, okay, and in various different places. In Africa, you've got coups going on and so forth. And what he's saying is that we need to show that democracies and that free market systems work, that they deliver for people. They deliver uh, in terms of uh, a decent standard of living, in terms of economic hope, in terms of fairness, uh, in terms of fair policing as well. It isn't just economics. Uh, in terms of a reasonable life standard. And that we have political systems that work. Uh, the Chinese have been arguing, Xi Jinping, they've been laughing at us. They're saying, you know, you're so deadlocked over there. You've got such hyper gridlock because of the hyper partisanship of the Republican and the Democratic parties. You can't even make decisions on your most important problems. Climate change, immigration, uh, wage laws, whatever, health care, you know, part of your population won't even get uh, wear masks. Uh, you have a big argument about everything. It doesn't work. That's the argument that China is taking to the world. And Biden is saying, no, we have to take the counter argument to the world and show uh, the world that, in fact, the democracies are working. So he's been trying to sell that to Capitol Hill. 
uh, since he's taken office and he's got these bills up there still uh, being debated. And now he's in Europe with the G7 and all I can tell from the headline, I haven't read the story yet, but, but he's taking the same argument to the G7. We've got to show that as a group of Western, uh, not just Western, Japanese are included as well, but uh, as democracies and free market economies, we got to show we deliver a decent standard of living, that we can deal with the coronavirus, that we can deal with climate change, we can deal with all these difficult issues, so we need to come together. That's what he's arguing. So that's a very important uh, story, and that's a very important news trend uh, for me to keep up with. This picture from the 2015 G7 of Angela Merkel and Obama deserves a caption contest of what is she saying to Obama at this moment. Uh, she's leaving the world stage uh, after being the longest serving democratically elected uh, uh, pres uh, leader in Europe. Uh, she's leaving now. And uh, I think she did a great job. Well, she's going to be missed, that's for sure. Um, she's had a steady hand in Germany, and that's been very important uh, for Europe, very important for Europe, but it's also been very important for us while we were you know, bouncing around. I mean, I think I think one of the interesting questions, and I don't know whether or not it's raised in stories today, but it's certainly been raised in, in stories uh, about the beginning of Biden's trip, and that is whether or not the Europeans have confidence in Biden's slogan, America's back. America's back, meaning back, recovering back from the virus, but back in the international ballgame, back into the uh, climate accord, the, the, the Paris climate accord, uh, trying to get back into the Iran nuclear agreement, back into the world diplomacy game. And I read a few things where people are saying, um, you know, is Trump going to be a Grover Cleveland, you know, one term and then he's out and then comes back for a second term? Uh, is Biden for real? Is this where America is going? Or is he an interim? Is he a sandwich uh, between two, <laughs> sandwich between two, two, two loaves of a uh, very anti-world America first, uh, stay at home, uh, Trump or Trumpism? Uh, and that's a question that's that's obviously in people's minds overseas. So that's an important story that I'm interested in following and trying to understand. I was struck by the fact that I saw a Gallup poll. I'm not sure if in the paper or online that showed that Biden had <coughs> an approval rating just behind Angela Merkel among international uh, audiences. Thank you. I uh, just want to uh, say there's been breaking news from the G7 summit. Uh, the world leaders have announced they will donate 1 billion vaccines worldwide. So that's that's not enough, but it's a good start. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that will uh, dent the crisis overseas. A couple of weeks ago, we had John Branch, a New York Times sports writer with us. And we talked about the story of how in ultra marathon running, ultra running, 21 of the top uh, top runners died in China in one event, and we talked about uh, talked about that. Uh, we're just looking at the national section. After a grim year, oyster farmers anticipate a summer boom, and uh, steps for employers and workers to reopen safely. Uh, this is about Merrick Garland confronts challenges of leaks in 21st century journalism, and it's been fascinating to see his story, right? His arc of not getting the Supreme Court seat and be, having it stolen from him by uh, Mitch McConnell and now uh, as uh, the head of the Justice Department as the Attorney General. Well, seeing how he unfurls the uh, prosecution of uh, at least, say, 30, 40, 50 of the 400 people charged in the January 6th attack on Congress and seeing how he carries out his vow the other day to protect voting rights against uh, uh, any incursions uh, at the state level is going to be very important. I mean, it's clear. I mean, Merrick Garland's interesting because he strikes you as a very mild-mannered man. Mm -hmm. He doesn't talk. Uh, you look at his judicial decisions. They're very carefully thought out. There's, there's, there's no sharp rhetoric. There are no edges. And yet, uh, in his job as attorney general, it seems to me he's going to have to have an edge. He's going to have to have a toughness, uh, and he must have, because he did, if you go way back, he was 
at the Justice Department in the prosecution of Timothy McVeigh for the Oklahoma City bombing. So he's got that edge, but we haven't seen it for a long time. It'll be interesting to watch to see how that unfolds. One aspect, of course, is that uh, when he didn't get that seat, it was not because he was some left wing, uh, you know, ideologue. Uh, and uh, that was one of the many tragedies of what happened uh, after Scalia died. Uh, here's an interesting story. Some Orthodox Jewish women shun vaccine after rumors about fertility. There is no evidence that vaccines cause pregnancy problems. And this doctor is, par is part of a task force to educate Orthodox women about vaccine safety. We talk a lot, uh, Hedrick, about the importance of ha vaccine hesitation among, uh, among people of color and especially Black people in the United States. Mm -hmm. But the single biggest indicator that you are not going to take a vaccine is if you're a white Republican male, is what the studies show us. And uh, that's where we are right now. Uh, this was an unusual story. A uh, humpback whale catches man and then spits him out, like a real life Jonah uh, and the whale story. And he's, he survived. And uh, she won a $40,000 scholarship and then gave it up at graduation. Oh, that's very interesting. A Harvard bound senior offers her prize to other students. Wow. Um, she already had tuition and room and board covered, so she gave her uh, her prize away. What a wonderful story. Uh, I'm a big reader of obits. How about you? Um, I glance at them, but I don't, uh, you know, if it's somebody I knew or remember, uh, then I, then I, um, I read carefully. Uh, the, the obit of, uh, Jean Le Carré was wonderful because it was about the quality of his literature. Uh, but I'm in my 80s, and a lot of people my age turn to the obit page first to see who's around and who's not around. I don't do that. Uh, I, if, if there's something that attracts me, I don't, I don't avoid it. I mean, when I get to that point of the paper, I'm turning that page the same way you are, and I see it. And if somebody catches my eye, I'll read it. But it, that's not a section that I turn to on purpose because of my age. One of my friends who was in his late 80s used to joke that he checks out the obits to see if he's still alive. <laughs> and uh, this you is- do that, you're in bad shape. <laughs> um, we need to talk about your, uh, your coverage of Martin Luther King. And there's an obit here about Martha White, 99, activist who sat in a white seat and started a 1953 boycott that became a template for Martin Luther King Jr. So can you just talk a little bit about your coverage of Dr. King? Yeah, I first saw uh, Martin Luther King. My, 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 I began covering civil rights when I was still working for United Press International in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, and there was a, uh, Nashville was one of the seedbeds of the civil rights movement when it exploded in February, 1960. Actually, that's where I met Dave Halberstam and, and began to form a lot of friendships that were important to me later on. But after I joined the Times uh, two years later in 1962, um, I, I, they sent me literally in the second week uh, that I was on the paper, they sent me to Albany, Georgia, where Martin Luther King was demonstrating against uh, Jim Crow laws down there. Uh, and I remember seeing him get hauled off and get arrested there. Uh, and I was just getting into that kind of coverage and then followed him around the South, uh, probably most prominently in Birmingham, Alabama. And in May 1963, um, there was just a huge campaign that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was his organization, uh, and that uh, the SNCC, the, uh, the student, <clears throat> excuse me, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had mounted and CORE and some other uh, uh, civil rights groups had mounted. Uh, and I I'm, was there covering the dogs, watching uh, uh, the fire hoses be turned on. I remember Rev, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, one of the Birmingham ministers working with Martin Luther King, uh, was slammed against the wall by the power of one of those fire hoses. People don't understand. That's not just somebody turning on a hose. It's really powerful. Um, and probably uh, the most vivid memory I have was uh, a night where Martin Luther King had actually gone back to Atlanta for the weekend and Claude Sutton, the uh, other, the senior New York Times correspondent in the South, 
uh, and I were having dinner with uh, Carl Fleming of Newsweek, and somebody came running in the phone. Uh, there's a phone call for you for, for Claude Sitton, and it was the beginning of a night-long riot that went on um, because the Gaston Motel, which was in the heart of the African-American district of Birmingham, had been bombed, and so had the home of Martin Luther King's brother, uh, Matthew King, I think his name was, who lived in Birmingham and was a minister in Birmingham. Both those had been bombed and all night long. Um, we uh, we ran uh, with the crowd. Uh, police were firing tear gas. I remember at one point I'd written a story for the New York Times earlier. I went. To, we used to use pay phones in those days, and we used to dictate the stories into the New York Times. Believe it or not, there was a recording room. You dictate in, and somebody would type out what you dictated. And I had filed a story earlier, and I had to keep doing updates to the story. And so I went to a payphone as I was in one of these little plastic, it looked like glass, but actually plastic booths where you could see out. And the uh, Birmingham police had a couple of armed cruisers. They looked like armored cars. They weren't looked like tanks, but they looked like armored cars. And they, they were inside, somebody was inside it with a microphone, go home, everybody go home, you'll be arrested. Uh, you're violating the, uh, there was no curfew, but but you're out late, you're, you're violating the law, go home, be peaceful, no, 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 whatever. And suddenly I see this damn car, this armored car coming right straight at me in the phone booth. I don't have any idea what to do. There's no way I can run away from it, get away from it. And it looks like it's going to smash into the phone booth. And, and um, uh I, I don't know, they must have figured maybe some rioters were hiding in the phone booth. I don't know what they thought. Anyway, at the very last minute, it swerved away. And I went back to dictating my story um, to the New York Times. And next morning, enormous devastation. And the next day, uh, John F. Kennedy called out the National Guard to uh, keep peace in Birmingham. But I dealt a lot with, uh, with him, uh, with King there. Uh, he had press conferences often. Uh, daily comments about what was going on. I remember at one point talking to Andy Young, uh, who eventually became the mayor of Atlanta and, and the United Nations ambassador, but was then very, very close to King. And he was the key negotiator with the city of Birmingham uh, on the issues of desegregating uh, drinking fountains and workplaces and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I talked to Andy and uh, this was the day King decided to go join the demonstration himself, uh, knowing that he would be arrested. And Andy told me that Coretta King, uh, Martin Luther King's wife, said, you got to get out there. You got to put on your overalls and get out there and march because some of the young people and SNCC uh, were kind of teasing King at that point and suggesting that he had them out front and he had other people out front and they were taking the risks and he was sort of running things and being the spokesman, but he wasn't personally engaged. And I think Coretta King and Andy Young, maybe some others, uh, Ralph Abernathy, who was his number two, thought that King needed to put his body on the line. He had done that before, in fairness. He had been arrested uh, before. So it was, but at this point, he wasn't doing that so much. Uh, and so I remember being at the Gaston Motel one morning and out came Martin Luther King in his full long coveralls, you know, up over the shoulders, one piece coveralls, top to bottom. Uh, he went out, sure enough, he got arrested. Uh, and he wrote that famous letter from the Birmingham jail who, who was criticizing moderates who were sitting on the fence, whites who didn't believe in Jim Crow, didn't believe in segregation, uh, but were not standing up and defending the rights of blacks. And one of the things that we know is that everyone should speak up when they can because it makes a difference. What a, a incredible opportunity to work uh, and cover, uh, you know, work at that time and cover the civil rights movement. And you knew you were part of history at that time yeah. when you were covering him, I'm sure. Yeah, I've got one other story that might interest you, you know, um, uh, and this really kind of came out of, I can't remember whether it came out of Albany or Birmingham, somewhere else. The favorite epithet of a lot of the uh, segregationists at that time was to condemn Martin Luther King and the uh, others who came into Albany or Gadsden, Alabama or Jackson, Mississippi or Birmingham or wherever. They're outside agitators. They're outside agitators. Our people are happy 
They're okay. Nobody's making a fuss. These are just outside agitators coming in. And I remember one night, I think it was in a Birmingham church, but he did it more than once. But the first time I heard it, I think it was in Birmingham. He came in and he was giving a speech and he was saying, uh, don't you get worried. Don't you give up. We're going to get there. I can see the promised land and that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, they like to call me an agitator. He said, do you know what an agitator is? Silence. He said, look inside your washing machine. Inside your washing machine, there's this pole and it's agitating the water and it's knocking the dirt out of your clothes. That's what an agitator is. Well, I am an agitator and you need to be an agitator because we need to knock the dirt out of this system. You know, this is this is King, you know, at his best. There he is, the fist in the air. Uh, it's one of my favorite pictures of Martin Luther King. I mean, it, incredibly. And then I was at the March on Washington, which uh, uh, just the thought of um, sends kind of chills up, up, up my spine. It was an unbelievably dramatic day. I mean, the speeches and what he had to say, and I have a dream and that haunting anguish tone of his, of the unfulfilled promise of America. But it was also a great day of celebration. I got there very early. I got there before dawn. Uh, the buses started rolling in uh, from the, all over, from New York, from New Jersey, from Wisconsin, from Ohio. Uh, and the, the agitators from the South came up on, by train to Union Station and there were buses that brought them. There was a sense of pride, of ownership, of people flooding uh, the mall around the Washington Monument, between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, and f and sitting under the trees, uh, you know, in the hours before the the the, the uh, ceremony began, you know, people were, kids were playing under the trees, uh, men were sunbathing, and with newspapers over their heads, uh, women were fanning themselves. I mean, it was a it was a wonderfully ordinary scene where you had a lot of African-Americans who had never been to Washington, D.C., who'd never sort of entered the Capitol, not the Capitol building, but the Capitol city, and thought of it as their own. And suddenly, I, that's what I saw as a reporter. I, as a reporter, I saw African-Americans saying, this is our capital. We're here. This is ours. This is our day. Now it was a highly mixed crowd. There were lots of lots of whites there, but it was predominantly African Americans, 60, 40, maybe something like that. It was it was a great day, well beyond the speeches, which were uh, amazing and important historically. Wow! I could just you know, listen to you talk about your coverage of just the civil rights. I think we could have another hour, but Hedrick, we want to keep going. Uh, we have so much more to cover here. Doug Levy says, so great to hear all of Hedrick's stories. I don't think we've heard all of them. Uh, we'll have to have him back to hear even more. Um, uh, Diana says, his stories are so rich. I could listen to his stories all day and night. And uh, Lote is watching from Bhutan. And says, oh, good. Such, a great, <laughs> such a great conversation. And uh, Rick Botello says, great to listen to Hedrick today. And uh, Sudha Parik, Neil's mom, says, Hedrick, your enriched experience and knowledge of the important history is benefiting all of us. Thank you. And so that's that's great. Uh, Jonathan wants to know if there'll be a memoir. You know, I don't know. People have been asking me about that. And what happens is I hadn't thought about doing it. My publisher says that... Uh, that uh, audiences aren't very interested in journalists' autobiographies. But I think the stories are important. And, and actually, the act of telling stories kind of gets me thinking about it. Uh, I want to tell not just stories, but say something about, about the press and relationships with sources. Uh, and, and the importance of the press, obviously, in a democracy, and particularly at a time like this, the kind of courage that 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 people need to have. Um, in my case, it was pretty unthinking. I just sort of was was doing the job. But uh, you know, I'm now a consumer. Uh, I read I read the Times and the Post every day, and I'm online and looking at other stuff uh, for the writing that I'm doing. And um, I have two different feelings about the the media today. One is I'm knocked out 
by the quality of some of the investigative reporting. It's really wonderful. The enterprise reporting, the reporting that didn't grow out of somebody else's decision, either to take some action or to say something or to do something that requires uh, coverage, but that the the, either the reporter or the paper or the news channel or somebody in, in social media decided this was something they needed to look into. This story about the wealthy, uh, 25 wealthiest people in this country paying no money, that was an enterprise story. That was, it, it was sitting there to be discovered, but nobody assigned it. Somebody just went and did it, and, and that's important. Um, I'm just encouraged by the quality of that and how much of there is. And I'm disappointed almost daily by what I think is the deterioration in the quality of general reporting. Uh, I was listening to a radio show on NPR yesterday, and they were talking about um, COVID and what you were talking about, death rates and vaccination rates. And so the host said, well, I understand that the, the, where the vaccination rates are low, uh, the death rates are high or they're, they're relatively high compared to the rest of the country. And one of the reporters said, yes, that's true. That's what we're talking about. And then could you give us some, uh, tell us about it. And the reporter went on and on and on without ever saying uh, in such and such a state or among this age group, or, there, were, there were never any facts. Um, there were stories the other day uh, uh, on the Joe Manchin story, when Joe Manchin said that he wasn't going to vote for the uh, for the People Act and he wasn't going to try to help get rid of the filibuster, and he wrote a, an op-ed in a Charleston, West Virginia newspaper. The New York Times lead story and the Washington Post lead story reported that, and each of them within the first three or four paragraphs quoted one quote from Manchin. For the next 15 paragraphs, there was analysis about what the implications of this for Biden's agenda and for everything else. You had to go all the way to the end of the story at the New York Times to get any more of what by uh, what the Manson said. Now, he actually also said that he thought the John Lewis Voting Rights Act was good. And he thought there were some good elements in the For the People Act. You didn't get any of that in the coverage. How can you do that? I mean, I, I just don't understand that now. So I, I have two opposite feelings about the press today. Uh, I'm, I'm just going through the uh, sections here. I did want to ask you, did you write any obits while you were at the paper? I or know. did you contribute, you contribute to any? Uh, I wrote a remembrance of Neil Sheehan uh, mm -hmm. shortly after he died, which the Times ran online. It didn't run in the paper. Somebody called me on Friday afternoon and said, could you do something quickly? And I did, but it was too late to get in the Sunday paper, but it got in the, I think it got in the Monday online. That's the closest to an obit that I have come to. No, I have, have not written any obits. All right. For those of you, speaking of obits, uh, please check out Miss You Graham, um, which is available on iOS and Android. Miss You Graham uh, for Remembrances. And this is the one that you, this is the remembrance you wrote of Neil Sheehan in 2000, in January of 2021. Yeah, 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 yeah. just after he died. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, he well, I got not, to tell you, you got somebody who's moving fast on this stuff. You're oh, that's the other Neil. Yeah. So this is, I got to, I take my hat off to the other Neil. Terrific. Yeah. And uh, we're just looking at the Sunday Styles cover is about 20 somethings bubbling with pent up energy want an epic summer. Uh, and the real estate cover story is finally making it to Manhattan, a pandemic silver lining for those dreaming of escaping the other boroughs, lower rents in Manhattan now. The Metropolitan cover story is the detective and the serial killer. Several murders in New Jersey were unsolved for years, but an investigator put a theory to test. And so this is about, you know, old cold cases, which there are a lot of TV shows about cold cases now. And the arts and leisure cover is, uh, it says, Steps Towards Healing, a Louisville artist's new memorial. Uh, for those of you who missed it, uh, Hedrick went to his first movie in you know, since the pandemic, you got to see In the Heights, uh, the new Lin-Manuel Miranda story. And a more perfect union, Eric Cervini's review of the engagement, America's quarter century struggle over same-sex marriage by Sasha Eisenberg. He uh, was a guest on my other show about COVID and the pandemic. And it was an excellent conversation. Neil, I, I mean, Hedrick, sorry. I wanted to ask, as you think about the changes in your lifetime in America, things that you may not have expected or you're surprised to see, would the change in having same-sex marriage and equality, marriage equality be up there along well, with, I, say... No, no question. 
no, Mar marijuana uh, legalization. Uh, what else? A black president, a black and Indian vice president. These would be things that would not have been seemingly possible in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? I think if you had said to anybody in the 1960s when I was covering civil rights, if you'd said to Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King and a couple of people around him might have said, well, I can see it on the horizon. They, they, they would have to maybe believe in it. But as a factual prediction, we're going to have a black president, you know, uh, in 40 years or something like that. I don't think anybody would have. It, it, it's, you know, yeah. Truth sometimes outdoes fiction. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here is the case against zoos. I mean, one of the things that has changed is the attitude towards circuses, right? In our lifetime, how that's changed. But here's the case against zoos. Uh, on the on as a lead in the Sunday Review, uh, talking about uh, uh, problems in the zoo business, and Daniel Ellsberg, accountable to no one, took it up on himself to attempt to steer the ship of state. And this is about the Pentagon Papers. And the cover of the New York Times Magazine is the annual New York issue. They do a once a year New York issue of the New York Times Magazine. It's a little confusing. And this is about the city awakens. And as it recovers from a year of lockdown, can New York heal the divisions the pandemic has revealed? So it's a good question. And I definitely want to read it. Are you a crossword puzzle? I am. Guy? I, I go to the, if you go for the, for the Times Magazine, that's the first page I go to. That's well, that's one, that's the section I do not start at the front. I start at the back. Awesome, that's, that's so great. And, and my so, wife says I'm crazy. I try to do it in ink. Uh, but then I've I've got I've got very active whiteout. <laughs> you, okay, that's my wife uses uh, a pencil, and uh, I can see why because sometimes it is uh, it is confusing. We only have a few minutes left. Let's talk about your YouTube channel. Well, I you know, we haven't talked about something else with the YouTube channel um, uh, raises, and that is the movement from print to video. Uh, it was tremendous. Uh, I am. Um, I actually began uh, doing not short videos, which is what I do on YouTube. I, my videos are three, four, five, six, seven minutes long. Uh, commentaries, I, I write a blog and then I uh, turn around and write it somewhat differently uh, and put it on YouTube. And then I've got a young editor that I work with. He's wonderful. Aaron Lebrun, who works for Ericsson Communications, which is a great little non uh, uh, firm up in uh, Maine. Uh, and he puts in uh, visuals for it, and he's just terrific. It, he livens the whole thing up. It, it does a great job. But uh, it was a huge change to go from uh, print to uh, video. Uh, the interviewing style is quite different. Um, in print, uh, particularly when I was covering a lot of national security, diplomacy, Vietnam War, um, arms control with the Russians and so forth, you can figure out a lot of what's going on and dope out what you think is going on and then go talk to people on background and uh, work it one way or another and ask your questions in ways that have them communicate to you what the story is without ever there saying it fully. But on television, you got to get it. You got to get it said there or you can use the power of the camera by asking a very difficult question and maybe somebody's dodging it, but you just let the camera sit on them and watch, let people watch them dodge it and people who are savvy get it. So that's one thing that's different. Then the, you have to then think in picture terms. Uh, you don't tell your story as a written story. You tell your story as a picture story. You put the pictures together knowing what the outline is from the reporting that you've done, but then you have to write your script to, uh, to the pictures you have. Uh, the writing has to be much, much more efficient. Uh, you, you have many fewer words. Uh, you've got to learn how to get an idea across much quicker. And sometimes between two pictures that are very important uh, that you've got to connect very closely together. Uh, and you've got to make transitions faster. You have to be very aware of where you are doing a long form documentary, doing a series of three, four, uh, five hours is much more like writing a book. It has to be organized architecturally, um, like a section uh, that they have, for example, now today at the New York Times on the Pentagon Papers. That has to be thought about in, in an architectural way. And then you break the elements down and deliver them. Actually, that's what we had to do with the Pentagon Papers. We had to stop and think, how were we going to do this? And then we, we actually came out with what it was, 10, 11 stories around which we built sidebar stories and we used documents and so forth. Um, television is more long form television, which is what I did. I didn't do short form television. 
uh, long form television is much more like uh, like book writing. So now I am taking written blogs and converting them uh, like the memory uh, that you mentioned uh, for, uh, for the New York Times of Neil Sheehan. We then took that and I did a video version of that. And Sheehan died about the same time as Hank Aaron. And so I turned that into two home run hitters, Neil Sheehan and Hank Aaron. And so I, you know, I used a different way to get into the story to make it more intriguing to a, a larger audience uh, whose name Sheehan might not mean much as opposed to readers of the New York Times, but Hank Aaron's name uh, um, meant a lot. Hank Aaron actually meant a lot to me. I, I not only was a great fan of his, but I actually got an honorary degree from Com Columbia College in Chicago the same time as Hank Aaron. So I oh. got to sit on stage with him and joke with him and talk. He was a wonderful human being. It's not only a great baseball player, he was a wonderful, wonderful human being. So anyway, um, I, don't, I have to say, uh, there are probably not many people out there who want to become journalists. And almost anybody who looks at journalism today is going to say it's a mess. Why well, become a journalist? And all I can say is I've had a ball. I've just had a wonderful time. Um, and I know Neil did. Uh, and so I would say, if you can be agile, uh, entrepreneurial, if you got a lot, it can shift from one way to another, uh, one thing to another, um, you can probably do it. And the demand for really good journalism is still there. It's still strong. Uh, well, now you're getting some of the video from, I see what, what, what uh, my friend Aaron Lebrun did was go back and find some pictures. And these are pictures that are in this profile I did of Neil. You, you don't see that when you get the op-ed or the re reminiscence in the New York Times, but you get that on as Malcolm Brown with a cigarette behind Sheehan. There's David Halberstam sitting in the corner typing away in that stupid little, these are uh, the helicopters in Vietnam over the Mekong Delta, uh, you know, God, riding one of those helicopters is crazy. Um, and there's a, a Buddhist monk who's just burned himself in Saigon in protest. There's No Din Zim, the... Uh, former leader of South Vietnam, and there's his brother, Noden Nu. So you see what, what the video has done is it's enriched the commentary so that you can actually see the characters. So I love the YouTube stuff. I mean, I'm, you know, I've done enough documentary work. I made 50 hours of long form documentaries. That's a lot of documentary hours. Um, so I got to like that and, and enjoy that. And um, that's what I'm doing, a little bit of on the YouTube. There's, there's, there's tanks in the streets. That's, that's when I mentioned, there's Dung Van Min. I mentioned he was the head of the junta that got overthrown. He got overthrown that day I was telling you about. Uh, before you go, can I just ask you, do you think we learned the right lessons from Vietnam? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I, I mean, if you look at the, you know, the way we've gotten involved, uh, look at the way we got involved in Iraq. Look at the way we got involved in Afghanistan. You know, we... we we, we have a problem. We think we're the greatest. And so we, and we think our ideas are the greatest and they may be the greatest for us, but you can't take uh, our democratic market system and impose it on others. Um, and particularly you can't do it with the use of force. Uh, now, uh, if we'd gone into Afghanistan with a limited mission we said we were going into, which was to get rid of um, uh, the Taliban, uh, get rid of Al Qaeda, uh, and stop them from having bases from which they could attack us uh, and kill uh, bin Laden. That's okay. That was a military objective. But we hung around and said, no, no, we're going to build democracy in Afghanistan. And at that point, we were making the same mistake that we made in Vietnam. The notion that, that our Western institutions and ideas can be grafted onto or maybe forced onto what is basically a tribal society, uh, you know, with tribal leaders in various provinces, and then maybe a tribal zirja, what they call it, a meeting of the tribal leaders, you know, to have a nation. Um, and we aren't the only people who've had trouble in Afghanistan. I mean, the Russians couldn't impose their power, and the British way back in the 19th century couldn't impose their power. So it's not unique to America. Big powers have this notion that we can project our system onto other countries. Uh, doesn't usually work. I mean, there's not a very good record. Uh, Ro ancient Rome, maybe. Um, ancient Persia, maybe. Way, way back when. Uh, but you've got to have an enormous army. You've got to occupy. And you've got to be willing to occupy, not only for decades, but for centuries. 
And I don't think we have that kind of imperial ambition. We have imperial ambition to project power, but we don't want to hang around. You know, we want to say, let's get out of there. Oh, you know, we've got this argument right now going on whether or not Biden is going too fast. Actually, he's going slower than Trump would have gone. I love the Republicans are angry at Biden for going too fast, uh, but he's going slower than, than than Trump. But the itch is there. The urge is there among the American people. It isn't just politicians of one stripe or another. You know, we've been there. Longest war in American history. And scratch your head. What have we gotten out of it? And what are we getting out of it? Um, you know. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think we really took home the difficulties. Each generation seems to have to learn the lesson for itself. Yeah, and that's and that's the hard part. Uh, what I'd, I would like to do is to make a couple of announcements and then come back to Hedrick so he can tell us one more time about reclaimtheamericandream.org. So uh, thanks for sticking with us, Hedrick. As we just wrap up here, I'm going to ask Neil to come back and thank our incredible production team and uh, all our audience members. We didn't get to show you all the comments, but there's so many great comments, including here's one from Laura Silverman, who says this has been inspirational, educational, and entertaining. And, uh, and Miriam says we should never have gone into Vietnam, taking over after the French failed in their colonialist objectives. And uh, Paula's putting in links to your website and of course, reclaiming the dream. So Neil, I know you are looking forward to this, uh, this episode. And I know you're really happy that we got to talk to Hedrick Smith. Absolutely, it was. It's a, obviously an incredible honor. Uh, just the history and and the scope. Um, you know, so many so many anecdotes. But to to look at both the work that uh, Hedrick's done on YouTube in terms of uh, uh, power to the to the people and the um, uh, the reclaim the American dream, and of course the stories about Neil Sheehan and the. Pentagon Papers, just incredible. Uh, Neil, if you can, uh, sorry, uh, Hedrick, if you can hang on with us for just a moment, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring it, you we'll back. Send you the comments. Will you send me the comments? Yeah, we will, we'll, we'll send you some of these comments. And Patricia says, today's conversation was diving deep. Hopefully everyone had their scuba gear on. And Paul <laughs> Knox says, uh, great show. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And uh, we, we also saw a comment earlier about uh, you should be doing a podcast yeah. because it is a so inspir uh, so educational. So let's do a couple of thank yous. Sure. That was Ron Thomas that, that said that we yeah. should, uh, you should do a podcast. Um, so we'll do a couple of uh, um, comments, fascinating discussion from uh, Eve, of course. Uh, so uh, Hedrick, we'll move you backstage for just a moment and then bring you back on screen. Um, so Shri, what we want to do, I want to make sure that first of all, next week, I hope everyone can join us for another edition. Uh, our guest is going to be Kate Doty. Uh, she's the author of Mergers and Acquisitions, or Everything I Knew About Love I Learned on the Wedding Pages of the New York Times. Uh, she is a writer and former editor at the New York Times, where she covered the news of food, weddings, business, New York, and more. So please join us uh, next week, Father's Day. Uh, we'll be talking about weddings and, and such uh, with Kate. Uh, in addition to, uh, um, to that, we want to make sure people know again about uh, She's on Call. Uh, we mentioned uh, that the uh, next week's epi this, this episode, starting at 11 a.m. Eastern time, is going to be all about teeth. Uh, but what's also uh, great is that this is the one-year anniversary of She's on Call, which launched as a 30-minute add-on to our Sunday New York Times read-along. Uh, and you can see all the uh, 96 guests they've had over 47 episodes over the last year. So congratulations to Dr. Sojana Shaker and Dr. Marina Kurian and the production team, uh, Julia Weeks, uh, Rose Horowitz, uh, Vandana Menon, uh, and Shri uh, helps out as well as an executive producer on that show. But congratulations. Uh, and then, of course... Um, we also want to encourage folks to watch on Thursday at 7 p.m. Our friend Stefan Kaplan has the Spin It Social Hour, and his guests are Anna and Jordan Rathkopf. Uh, so please make sure to join him on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. It will be a definite, definitely be a great, uh, great show. We couldn't produce this show without a great team, in addition to Sri and myself. Paula, Steve, Julia, and Carla Barnakas. Carla, in particular, um, it helped get uh, uh, the show 
uh, organized both this show and last week's show with uh, um, uh, Linda Amster. And we want to do a shout out to uh, Hedrick's sister-in-law, Nancy uh, Riggum, uh, who is a classmate of Carla's. Uh, so uh, Nancy, thank you very much uh, for helping us uh, get in touch. I believe she went to high school and possibly junior high as well with Carla. So and maybe we'll have, sorry? And college. And college. So we're going to uh, want to get in touch with her to get stories about Carla at some point. Um, and uh, speaking of Carla, we want to make sure that uh, you know about the local connection. It's a uh, great newsletter that's uh, put out uh, weekly that Carla edits. Um, and you can definitely subscribe uh, using the, the link bit.ly uh, slash local um, news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. Uh, the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University uh, brings the local connection newsletter every week. It offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. And best of all, it's free. Um, so with that, we'll bring back uh, uh, Hedrick Smith for some closing thoughts and uh, talking again about Reclaim the American Dream. Hedrick, over to you. Um all I want to say is I'm grateful to you for setting this up. I love the comments. I appreciate it. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to hear people interested in the history, uh, both of Martin Luther King, the Vietnam War. Uh, we didn't talk a lot about Russia. We talked some about Russia. Um, you know, being well-informed and knowing something about history is absolutely crucial for our democracy. And we have a kind of a know nothing movement going on in this country at the moment, a lot of misinformation. And so services like yours, broadcasts like yours, which focus on the news, um, whatever aspect of it is. And I love the way Sri goes through uh, all the different sections of the New York Times, uh, which shows the variety of stories, the variety of subjects you could be interested in. Uh, but being informed about what is happening around you, uh, whether it's politics or healthcare or, or the world abroad, science, entertainment, you name it, uh, is one of the ways in which we have a vibrant society. So, and I feel uh, extraordinarily lucky to have had uh, my adult education, because I think journalism has been an education to me. My adult education was paid for 20, 26 years by Pun Salzberger, by the New York Times publisher. Uh, I got to do, go all over the world and get educated thanks to, thanks to them. Uh, and, then, and then for another 20 years making documentaries for PBS and Frontline. Uh, and now I'm just doing it for fun because uh, I enjoy it. And I wanna thank people for being interested and, and thank you for uh, making it available. And particularly, I appreciate your generous, uh, inform generously informing people about uh, reclaimtheamericandream.org. Um, uh, I literally am working on it all the time. I just was working the other day on the voting rights section. I'm going to work on it more in the next two or three days to <clears throat> bring each of the states up to date that have changed their voting laws. And I want to go back and say, take a look at the two maps under the progress reporting on voting rights. The map that shows the states that expanded mail voting in 2020 and the states that are now retracting it. It's amazing. There's an amazing overlap. Why the flip-flop? That's going to be one of my next columns. Well, thank you so much. We want everyone to check out the website, reclaimtheamericandream.org. We want them to subscribe to your YouTube channel, read what you're writing. You're the uh, what kind of retirement is this, Hedrick? Uh, the YouTube channel is called The People Versus the Politicians, very much on purpose because there's a tendency for people to think of Democrats and Republicans in politics as being different. And of course they are. But as politicians, they're often interested in systems that keep them in power, that protect politicians. We the people want more choice. Uh, we, want, we want more open elections. We like nonpartisan primaries. We like ranked choice voting. We don't want to have the power of big money. Uh, and that's why I called that channel the people versus the politicians. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And we'll say goodbye to everybody. And please have a great day and a great summer, Hedrick. Look forward to your work, seeing your work. Sri, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure being with you. And Neil, thanks for your kind comments and your loyalty over all these years. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a good week. We'll see you next week. <laughs>